I'm, I'm uh, delighted and pleased to introduce to you uh, Dr. Will Patterson. He has this, this a very, uh, oh, you can clap back for him. <laughs> he has this very background, and actually, you know, he talks about STEM, and his background is actually in uh, education policy. And so uh, I found that unique that he's such a passionate uh, uh, scholar on STEM, but his background is not in STEM. And so he has some researchers, he just has a lot of uh, interesting uh, information to share. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, uh, Dr. William Patterson, who is an instructor at the, in the School of Engineering at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, the flagship institution in Illinois. Dr. Patterson, now let's <laughs> Thank y'all for having me. And I do have to kind of um, uh, let uh, Wayne know that actually I'm STEM and heart. Okay. And so I'm STEM hearted within the context of being a hip hop generation because hip hop culture is STEM related. It's totally STEM focused. And my work has been since I graduated from the U of I uh, with my degree in educational policy. Uh, I told my, um, my committee, I said, so what do y'all think about graduating a hip hop mind as scholars? I said, well, well, we don't know if you are ready for that. I said, well, you should be because I'm here now. Uh, and the academy is going to continue to grad graduate more folks like us. And that was in 2000. And so to deny who I am with a PhD is not, is not real. It's, it's something that's real. It is with a PhD. Uh, it's something that institutions are grappling with. That was back in 2000. So now we're at 2015, where I've learned a lot about the academy in so many different ways that, that it's been exciting to share and to learn what institutions like Harris Stowe is doing in this great moment you all are in, uh, in terms of uh, educating students of color and really being a real strong focus of the area. Uh, the talk today is really going to focus on this idea of decoding Dr. Dre. And Dr. Dre, I use Dr. Dre really as a metaphor to really expand the conversation about STEM within the context of, uh, of utilizing hip hop as a gateway to engage young people who um, have maybe have not had the conversation, whether it's in their home, in their school, in their community, about the importance of STEM and why STEM matters in today's age, uh, particularly in relation to rebuilding urban communities like St. Louis. Um, I talked again about um, who I am in terms of being a hip hop minded scholar and really thinking about the U of I. I'm born and bred Champaign, Urbana. I have three children. My oldest daughter is, uh, is going to be graduating to watch you this year, I have a son at um, North Central, he's a sophomore, um, and then I have a 14-year-old. Um, my family owns a tech firm, uh, we're business owners, I mean, we're part of the fabric that makes a difference in terms of having means and resources to reinvest in communities. So at the end of the day, my work is about reinvesting in communities, not just about educating, I'm really concerned about um, um, young people's lives and communities being dilapidated and they're being limited to no black businesses, that matters to me. And so how do we change that? I'm concerned about the Ferguson experience and, and what young people are saying about that and, and, and talking about, we said this was gonna happen and now we're seeing it in live color going down right before us. And so those students, in, in my opinion, that makes Harris Stowe Society are so passionate to make change. They mean it and they're standing on it and let, let the world know about that. And so as an educator, I'm very excited to impart some knowledge in terms of my own experiences as it relates to what do we do with this great moment that we're in. So Dr. Dre uh, did something very phenomenal um, in terms of uh, Apple buying Beats for $3.2 billion. Now $3.2 billion is a whole, whole lot of money that leaves the community, a whole lot, right? And so we start talking about young people that at one point, when I think about the targets of young people, that was Dr. Dre back in the late 70s. No different, locked out, disenfranchised, frustrated with academics. Um, not poised for opportunity. What does that mean in a shifting environment where you start talking, looking at social policy as it relates to war on poverty programs and hip-hop generation is being defined by that. Reagan administration cutting those funds and then young people being left out to the lurch in terms of trying to figure out how to make way in society when society has forgotten about them within the context of Reaganomics um, and change with there within. And then put on top of that crack cocaine and all the things associated with dilapidated housing and things that come out of that. And so you have a space where the young people begin programming for themselves. And then where hip hop comes in. They start using various elements of technology to build community. So they utilize music, they utilize uh, turntables, they utilize microphones, they utilize art 
to engage and to create and connect with each other. But while they're doing that, other folks are looking at that and seeing the business opportunity, seeing the numbers grow. This is something popular. And we're in a capitalist society. It's always about the money. There's always a business angle to everything that we do. But for some odd reason, something happens where we love the culture, but we forget about the business. And the business dictates the opportunity, it, it creates the employment, it creates everything that we need in terms of redeveloping our own communities and our own spaces. And so my thing has been, how do I re-engage my young people? Because I didn't want to leave, I didn't want to leave the hood and leave my community. My mom was still there. My grandma's still there. My friends are still there. The people that I care about are still there. But the businesses I knew weren't there anymore. The houses that Ms. Johnson used to live in wasn't there anymore. Where do those people go? Where do these families go? These barren lands and these plots of land, these empty buildings. What happened? One of the ways that uh, higher education has engaged communities over the years has been for those that understood that too often when there is undereducation or miseducation, folks get afraid and not trusting of institutions, be they black or white, um, that they get become create enclaves in, amongst themselves. We saw that in the Delta South with the sharecroppers. Okay? Tuskegee Institute understood how to reconnect in terms of Booker T. Washington purposing George Washington Carver them to go out and take a Jessup wagon and do that work and engage those communities of higher education with the sharecroppers in terms of not only offering some of the sciences that was learned through crop rotation and things like that, but also learning from the folks that were in the field, indigenous knowledge, indigenous scholarship. Okay? I said, so if we're the descendants of sharecroppers, meaning that when the Great Migration happened and we come to train and the buses and cars that's dropped off in St. Louis and East St. Louis and Chicago and Detroit, then what does that look like in terms of the millennials and hip-hop generations? Who are those folks today and what would a Jensen wagon look like today? And so I started thinking about that within that context. Mm -hmm. And so as an educational policy analyst and looking at curriculum instruction in higher ed, I began to say, how can I engage my community in a way that is going to communicate and resonate with young people uh, that are of the post hip or of the descendants of the sharecroppers. What does a Jessup wagon look like if it originally it looked like a wagon with a horse? Well, now it's an SUV and an airstrip. Okay? But understand that when this came down the street, it had everything to do with the black music experience. You see B.B. King in there. You, so I'm going to be able to talk to Auntie because she said, that's B.B. King. I got that album sitting there under the, under the budget. There's uh, uh, Melly Mayo from Grandmaster Plash and the Furious Five. I'm going to connect with that generation. There's Ray Charles. There's Paul Funkadelic. There's all these groups in terms of, when we start thinking about hip hop culture, it's not something that was created by itself. It's something that is, is, is an amalgamation of all of this, of the music and the lived experience of black folks, right? From distressed environments, okay? Repurposing culture within their context. And so, I looked at that in terms of the academy, in terms of the tools and the, and the resources that laid around U of I, and said, okay, how can I use this giving the spirit of the work that I'm interested in, which is civic scholarship, civic engagement, and urban renewal and urban, and urban change within that particular context. What does that look like when I take this Airstream trailer? So when I rolled into East St. Louis and drove this trailer down the highway, I had people stopping me on the highway because they want to know who the stars were up in the trailer. And it, my, their destiny was rolling down the street as they saw it. Where I had people stopping at the uh, Veterans Center in East St. Louis, coming down the street, getting off the um, uh, city buses and dancing down the street and going back home and getting their full cache of records and, and documents and saying, here, I got James Brown's first record right here and I did this here. And these are veterans. And they're offering their knowledge and their experiences because Hip Hop Express showed up and it was something they could identify with and trust. And then as a scholar, I could then learn from their experiences and then think about ways in terms of the research and the work that was happening in the academy and make that bridge because they saw this trailer and the trailer made sense. And this trailer would show up in different spaces where people that were, were city governments and organizations that were concerned about what was happening in communities, it would show up and there would be no violence. 
because folks knew how to stop the violence in the neighborhood because I kept the mic out. That also has a 20,000 watt sound system that soon as I put a record on, you put the right record on, all of a sudden, everybody's coming outside and people are, are building communing. They're communing again. They're sitting on porches. They're talking to the neighbors. They're firing up grills. They're talking about uh, re redeveloping their houses. They're talking about the different things that matter in the space. They're talking about crime prevention programs. They're talking about not having jobs. The conversation is happening all because Hip Hop Express showed up within the context of playing the right records that made a difference, that were safe, that weren't disrespecting the experiences and the cultures of black people, and that did not happen because they appreciated the culture and they appreciated the motif. So as the conversation continued in terms of what Hip Hop Express had offered with the first trailer, after they got repurposed, I got another trailer. Mm -hmm. And this other trailer, I call Hip Hop Express 2, the boom box. Now this was a hollow shell, and I put a whole bunch of tools. At that time, the iPad had just came out. Um, there were some new interfaces with DJ equipment, things like that came out. And a lot of young people were on PlayStation with the video game Guitar Hero, <coughs> and they had DJ Hero. And so I remember that, you know, I was a young person, the thing that really inspired me to be really involved in hip hop was I saw the DJs and how they built community with the records. And that's what did it in terms of, oh, I remember that and how that happened with me. Let me try that again. Well, I had to scale it up in terms of the technology that existed. And that's where the DJ Hero programs and PlayStation programs that were offered to young people, and they got right in there, had lines out the trailer, wanted to play DJ Hero and do different things like that. And then I could graduate them up to the real DJ equipment and say, hey, if you play the right record, you don't cut your grandma out with that record, learn how to use a microphone, you can have community like this all of the time. And young people will see that. But the second trailer was even more purpose because it was an actual recording studio that was used by a facility down out of uh, uh, Clarksville, Tennessee. And I would bring it on, 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 on the block and young people would ask me, man, how much does it cost to get in that trailer and record? Like it doesn't cost anything, just make sure no violence happens when we're on the block. I said, can y'all handle that? Yeah, we can do that. I said, but do you have a business or are you recording because you're trying to make a CD to impress your friends? Oh, I want to make money. Oh, okay. I said, well, I need to talk to you about your studio being a business first. I said, because you want to be a business. I said, you want to operate this facility in a manner where it's cost effective and you can realize profit because you made the appropriate decisions. Because you use it resources wisely, you've been able to do that. So I needed to think about how to shift this and, and, and give them a model that, that could be demonstrated. So we turned the recording studio into a solar power recording studio, sustainable energy. So since I knew that my institution from a policy perspective was investing in sustainable energy, then I then had to guide and make certain that my instruction and my educational approach was aligned with where the institution was at in terms of what they were investing in and not be an afterthought in terms of just a spin-off. So that got me into beginning conversations with engineering and looking at different ways and who, who was managing the, the sustainable engineering initiatives at the URI. That opened up a whole new realm of having conversations with young people and underrepresented groups to go into engineering because it applied within the context of a culture they were interested in, which is everything, right? <coughs> and so from there, um, as we hit, I worked with some senior design students. Um, one kid was um, Czechoslovakian, and the two other two were white kids uh, from the suburb of Chicago. And they were highly interested in the Hip Hop Express project in terms of turning it into sustainable energy. But I said, if we're going to do the project, understand that I want you to partner with the National Society of Black Engineers or other African American students to get them thinking about engineering within the context of the culture. I want you to appreciate the cultural part first, and the technology comes second, right? And they understood and appreciated that. They said, oh, by the way, well, we can also, while we, so they put out the whole schematics and the design. They said, we can also create a solar powered cell phone charger. Okay, I said, all right, that's slick. So we met and did that, and they created a solar power cell phone charger. And that became a crucial and important key because, as we know, young people today are constantly thumbing. Everything that's happening is based on the devices that we have ready and available in terms of the smartphone technology. This becomes crucially important, and this bridges the next part of the conversation in terms of um, this idea of Beats Audio um, and um, decoding Dr. Drake. Uh, within the context of starting off 
really with the head problems. Let me start with I'll show. What I'm showing you and what I'm scrolling through, and I'm going to work back down. I just want to show you how I organize my. This is actually this is the this is the content from my class decoding Dr. Dre, and I want to utilize online content that was palatable to on their phone. So what you see on the screen is actually what it looks like on my on your cell phone. That the, the way that information is architected in this manner, how they eat information became critically important because visuals make a difference in terms of hip-hop generations. Multi-sensory learning is crucially key. And so I had to make certain that the device was something they could recognize. But I had to then put the content in there in a manner that would be um, academic and solid. So with the, the uh, headphones, um, I talk about this, as you see, as a method to inspire social change in urban environments. Because young people in those environments have to make the change. Nobody else can do that. They are hip hop generations always bring the next, right? And so if you follow what's hot and what's next with them, you're always going to be in touch and in tune with what this is going to inspire them to want to learn and take on their time. Okay? And it's culturally censored learning lesson uh, planning. And things that really think about that as it resonates uh, with them in the context of why this matters. Because remember, we're dealing with things that, that when you start talking about scholarship and STEM, STEM is not always sexy. But actually, in most things, the folks that say it's quite boring, right? Unless you're really into that as hardcore and that's your thing, right? So I had to figure out a way to make it uh, sexy. And our former chancellor at the U of I, Chancellor Herman, said, look, he said, I'm a New York guy. He said, I, he said, we have to make certain that the University of Illinois finds this cool factor. He said, because when I think of a cool institution, it's not University of Illinois. He said, it's University of Michigan because they did the cool social things. He said, you know, I didn't do the cool social thing. That was when he was chancellor, and that was about six, seven years ago, right? So now, Phyllis Wise is totally state, 100%. That's her focus, and she's about the money, right, and entrepreneurship. So think about beats within the context. It was me just paying attention, not only just knowing these trends, but just seeing what was happening on campus. I was seeing a car walk across the front of my car, I'm like, why don't they have these BC headphones on? And I know that these things cost $199 right out the gate, that's a lot of money, and they're everywhere. And I said, well, what other headphones are they wearing? They weren't wearing anything else. I said, okay. I said, they, I said something interesting going on here. My folks are spending $199 as a starting point for headphones, all the way up to $599. Then, wearing five million dollars headphones and not even having plugged up their fashion statements. That's the students that we're dealing with today. $600 headphones just wrapped around your neck. Ain't nothing, we ain't listening to nothing, but they're on, okay? So I had to start thinking about who Dr. Dre was and why would they appreciate that? Well, Dr. Dre's a geek. Now, the propaganda's been that he's been a gangster and he's NWA and he all this, but at the end of the day, the front part of his lived experience, he's a geek and a technologist as a kid that couldn't find his way in public school. Public school didn't know how to educate him. So he jumped around school and then he left school. During the crack era, where there was also deindustrialization happening in South Central LA. So now you have that, then compound so crack, uh, crack cocaine on top of that. And hustler culture associated with that. Now you have the makings of somebody that's highly innovative with a whole bunch of street entrepreneurs around them seeing the potential of what this person is, right? And so when I started thinking about understanding the cultural context of this idea, and I, I said he didn't know he was going to develop a company worth $3 billion. He had no idea back in high school. Probably knew he was smart, and probably was so smart that he was frustrated they couldn't teach him, right? And we see that happen over and over and over again with our young people, right? So we started looking at this idea of students that are learning and the literature around that. I started talking about this was always in me. I didn't know how to get to it in school, right? Who are our kids? at Harris and where they're coming from in terms of the public schools and how are they reaching them, how they get here and what are they bringing here, right? When we start thinking about ways to engage them and say, okay, if I can get you, if I can show up with Hip Hop Express and inspire you, think about technology because you're interested, you're interested in this trailer, this reporting, these things like that, then I can have some larger conversation with you about the material science around these headphones. I said, what's, this is STEM right here. Right? I say, because this is material science. The architecture of that is science. 
I said, now if you really want that, I said, so ultimately, Dr. Dre's idea of being an engineer, a producer, and being very authentic in that, and appreciated in that, now if you are saying that you appreciated him and you're keeping it real within the context of him, you have to appreciate science and STEM. Else you're fronting, and now I got a call you want. See, in hip hop, we don't like to get called on stuff and, and say that we're not authentic, right? And so now I get to call you on it if you're really about this. But what that also does is providing an environment to inspire you to learn and to get engaged because I've given you content in a manner that you can appreciate. And if I do that, and then, well, if I'm doing it and my homie doing it, now it's a crew of us that are a community of learners that's thinking about this within that particular context. So, as I looked at the decoding of Dr. Dre and doing that work, I said the class, then, when we started thinking about, we have a program in your like Illinois Engineering First Year Experience Program, IFX. And IFX, every engineering student has to take IFX. Uh, as part of Engineering 100, and then you have electives that you can take off that. And so I uh, created this, the, the, this elective, decoding Dr. Dre, to ask these questions. With Dr. Green's United Beings for the vision, vision for building beats, what were the cultural engineering influences that ultimately shaped their, their business philosophy and product development strategies? What role can creative culture play in shaping the economic landscape of urban America? Can culture art be used to inspire urban students to pursue careers in uh, economic opportunities and still? And then what is that algorithm for <coughs> doing that? How do they find the ebb and flow in terms of getting that done, right? And so we have to go back to the beginning of hip-hop culture we think about it in that context. And so I would shape my, I would do my lectures and then post the content therein online. And so I would start off asking questions, keeping it real hip-hop and giving a conversation and starting a conversation around Jimmy Iovine and Dr. Dre and this whole idea of peace and apathy, okay? And one of the things that I talk about is, <coughs> okay, let's be clear, when we start thinking about Apple and Beats, Beats was the biggest threat to Apple. That's why they bought them. Understand that Steve Jobs, until he passed away, he was the cool factor in terms of technology. Everybody waited for Apple to release the next big thing. And the concern after Steve Jobs died was, was Apple going to stay viable as a company without Steve Jobs at the helm? They said because Tim Cook is not Steve Jobs, right? And then you got this young upstart company, remember, like Apple did to IBM, right? So we've seen this happen before. So now you got this upstart company establishing its brand and making a lot of noise with headphones. And they're making a whole lot of money, right? And this started occurring, and we started thinking about that. We had to go back some more in terms of thinking about straight out of Compton, Crazy Brothers, Money, Attitude, Genius, and Spirit of Entrepreneurship, what I just talked about to you, talked to you earlier, where you had folks like Easy E. And I utilized these photos because I wanted folks that were international to understand if the guys on the block and the girls on the block don't discount their knowledge and their ability and their skill set. Don't folks just think folks out here fools and buffoons and don't know. Very smart. <coughs> Very entrepreneurial related, right? To the point to create a multi-billion dollar um, economy based on our culture. And so easy e understanding that and building with Rufus Records, so on and so forth, going on to talking about technology, ain't nothing but a G thing, intersection and personification and a crossover field. But remember, technology has always been around the hill. We start thinking about Pauline Funkadelic. We can go back to George Clinton and the whole Funkadelic P-Funk crew and really thinking about that they, their whole sound is based on space and sound and all that synthesizers and all that back in the 50s and 60s. That's what represented, space represented technology and STEM and robotics and, and space travel. And it looked like there were big knobs and things like that. Parliament did that. And this guy in particular, Bernie Worrell, was crucial in that, okay? And we start thinking about classically trained musicians and their advent and partnership with technology. And you start looking at great sounds and cultures as it relates to African-American music, we can take it even to Sigma Studios and the Philadelphia Sound, okay? Kenny Gamble, Leon Huff partnering, oh gosh, oh, is it, is it this time? <coughs> But one of the, um, I think Sigma Studios was developed by an engineer, electrical engineer, that was in love with jazz. And ultimately, Kitty Gamble and Leon Huff were the hot jazz musicians in Philly. 
they end up partnering in that space, and lo and behold, we now have what we know as a Philly sound that was created based on STEM. Okay? Right, so again, that appreciation for that culture and thinking about the context of automobiles in terms of mechanical engineering, aerospace engineering, um, looking at the combination of science and musicianship, genetic engineering, the people syndrome, thinking about all this different language, bioengineering, all this stuff was happening right before our eyes and we're not even recognizing and appreciating, at least my generation not understanding it until now. But maybe some of the folks of the Funkadelic and the Funk era could appreciate that to then translate into one of the hotter albums with the chronic, so on and so forth. Right? And these are all part, again, these are all part of my lectures, each uh, question. And then I will pose questions, things that you know, things like that. And so that would expand into um, this next one, looking at beats, bridging, engineering arts, and looking at how you do hip hop, right? <laughs> and so I'm talking about hip hop as a revolution in terms of social change. That's why I talk about this Ferguson moment being so hot, and these young people with the outcry and showing us what was happening in the communities in terms of police brutality and things like that. The draining we're talking about too back in the 80s, okay? That they talked about, you know, they're talking about the police and their anger with the police through some of their records. They were talking about this stuff. So these are things, these are things that are not new. But also at the same time, you have folks like Black Enterprise recognizing that Russell Simmons had cut a $30 million deal um, with uh, Columbia Records, right? And then he, so that began to rise, um, <coughs> staying true to the culture, but he's also, now he looks like success because he's sitting on top of a Rolls Royce, right? And then building, and you got folks like Public Enemy still talking about that, but also Public Enemy having probably one of the worst business deals in hip hop, and that being out. You have phone folks like Puffy Combs now coming and emerging and establishing his brand, okay? His brand, Diddy is a brand, not even as an artist, as a brand. Dre in the studio, okay? This authenticity in terms of, this represents technology and hip hop, okay? Keyboards and materials and things like that. But then this guy right here, understanding Noel Lee Monster Cable. Now this is where it becomes critically important because Monster Cable was already creating headphones and things like that. But it didn't have the culture and the marketing ability that it had until they partnered with somebody that was authentic like Dr. Dre. And so Monster Cable became the first partner with Dre Nim in terms of beats and building that. But he was already making wires and speaker wires and things like that. We didn't know it, we didn't care. But it, when it showed up in, in a headphone set, it made the difference, right? To the point that ultimately, um, uh, Ralph Jill, this gentleman right here, I brought him to the U of I to start talking about the emergence of technology, um, hip hop, and automobile manufacturing and the development of classic American brands like the Chrysler 300, the Charger, um, the Challenger, and the Viper. And him saying specifically that they use hip hop to design and develop their cars, which means again that engineering schools and schools that are STEM related should be thinking about the role that culture plays in these sciences as it relates to that, okay? And then, uh, then you start to see this brand being emerged and growing just beyond headphones, and now the influence is going into sports, is going into other things associated with it. And not only um, Chrysler, but now Ty Toyota hired this young brother Rob McConnell to redevelop the uh, Toyota camera. They said they want the Toyota camera to be have more sex appeal. So they hire a hip hop generation to come on in and give it larger rims, fatter um, a body design, boom and sound system, the sleekness that would be appreciated by a younger generation is going to buy a right? One of the most significant things uh, at this moment, and Peter Chow right here, was HTC decided to put $400 million into the Beats brand. $400 million, HTC cell phone said that we're going to invest in Beats because they understand how to market culture better than anybody else. They said they have better technology. They said they had how to market culture better than anybody else, right? So again, $400 million, that drove me right to have a conversation with the dean of engineering and say, we really need to pay attention to our engineering graduates, and they need to understand the role of culture in this. And if they don't, the first schools that begin understanding that, their graduates are going to be the ones that these companies are going to be looking for. Okay, so we have to be ahead of the curve on that. And fast forward up to looking at 
why then beats was beating up the streets of Apple. And I talked about earlier this whole idea. And I used different songs and different things like that in the language that the Let Them Be Ride song was Drake talking about this old and beating up the street, right? One of the most significant things that in terms of when I delivered this particular lecture was understanding that that it was to be to Apple's favor to then reach out and grab Beats as a brand to reestablish itself as a cool brand because this other generation, Apple wasn't putting out anything new that they already had. The phone, iPhone was already out. The iPad was already out. These were the most uh, recent gadgets that were hot that everybody used, but they're not hot anymore. Everybody got an iPhone. You might get the iPhone 6 and iPhone 7, but it's not cool. I mean, you have it, but we've seen it before. We need to see something different, and that kept it real, right? And so you had companies, again, reaching out, partnering, and Jimmy Ivey had already talked about, uh, had been meeting with Steve Jobs about how the music business was not going to survive if, if it did not get in bed with cell phones. <laughs> that it was crucially important for that to happen. And so those conversations began. While they were developing that, Steve Jobs they were working on the Macintosh, um, and then ultimately Tim Cook and this whole crew understanding that uh, there's like the worldwide computer, I think, programmers conference they had a couple of years ago. Uh, and they were introducing the new um, operating system for the iPhone. And Tim Cook had uh, Dr. Dre uh, on speakerphone while he's on stage with tens of thousands of people in the audience and millions watching online. And he said, you know, the system will let you do this, and then you'll have cool more people like this guy in your phone. And then he calls up Dr. Dre on the phone. And then Dr. Dre starts talking <coughs> to millions of people on the phone. And I say, what just happened with Tim Cook? To Tim Cook he just bought, he became the hottest CEO in the country because he was romanticized with the gangster in the eyes of technologists. NWA said, represents the hood. And so I got, he said, hey doctor, on the phone, right? And then Dr. Dre answers and that just made them go game watchers. And so I start, as I look at this and the students are digesting this and we're going through this and we're having all these questions, they begin looking at, okay, what does this mean? You know, in the context of like our purpose pictures and things they can find online. Now, again, I'm using content that's out there and available. What does this mean in, in the context of where this guy has had his authenticity and in terms of where he was at in his particular career? How did he find this rhythm? What was this algorithm for getting this done? Dr. Drake talks about this whole idea of beat streaming music being this service that, that the reason why they're going to be better than anybody else is because the algorithm is different. The way they do it is different, right? And so downloadable music is something far different now. It's all about streaming services. So I said, okay, now that you go through all this, I say, now what? What does that mean in terms of Tim Cook talking about this? And I did, and I talked about how he talked about the importance of Apple developing their products with humanities as a focus, right? So humanities and engineering and technology becomes crucially key. Sean Rabb looking and starting the, um, the, this website, Tinder, in terms of uh, dating service and it being worth, oh gosh, just seeing the growth in terms of $2.7 billion by 2019, right? All because he developed an app that understood the psychology of dating. Medical um, devices, looking at this, med CPU, and looking at the idea of engineering, science, mathematics, and humanities within the context of STEM. I want to put sisters here, Candace Mitchell and Chanel Martin, to start a company called Texturize. They look at hair care. But these sisters, one is a computer science major and the other is a chemist, right? And I wanted to line them up right with them because they're just as relevant because he might want to partner with them, they may want to partner with him, or they might end up working together. That interdisciplinary approach to connecting the disciplines and also the entrepreneurial opportunities becomes critical and key in terms of our young people having these great ideas and understanding and knowing the culture but knowing that this is a $10 billion industry. 10 billion, and, health, and, and hair care, right? Goes back to Madam C.J. Walker, don't it? Okay. All right, so, so that being said, we're at a crucial moment in terms of what does that mean for hairstyle. Hairstyle has something that other folks don't have. You have the culture students that understand hip hop, that are hip hop generationers, post hip hop generationers. And now this whole idea of cultural engineering is now what I'm calling it. I'm looking at cultural engineering as a discipline, right? We have something that the other schools don't have, that's the culture. 
The culture is prices, but people have put a price tag on it. And you see the dollars that's being generated off of it, right? To me, when I see that, that means research opportunities. That means um, graduate school. That, it just means development in so many different ways for the community in general, right? But it's realized in academies and institutions that can corral the content and corral the resources to fund the <coughs> opportunities of research in these particular areas and be at the table with um, uh, things like bioengineering medicine. And I was just talking to Dr. Turner earlier about that I was at a meeting uh, before I came here yesterday with um, uh, Professor Bashir, who is the head of the of bioengineering department at U of I. And he is considered U of I's rock star in this new school of medicine that's being developed at the U of I right now that the Board of Trustees are going to vote on next week. It's going to get approved. And he's talking about precision medicine and guided care, bioengineering within the context of that. And so I'm in a room where they're talking about the funding of that and Carl Health System just gave $100 million to the school to develop this medical school. They haven't even broke a brick yet. And, that's the, and they're the first ones at the table. And they're already in bed with Apple and Google already start talking about the research, $100 million. And they said they're going to do this all the time. And this, the governor of our state just cut $200 million from the U of I's budget. And the chancellor said, well, we don't need the money. We can't take any money from the state because the state's in no shape to provide the U of I any money. We don't need the money anyway. We need to help the state. We're going to fund it on our own dime. Mm -hmm. Now, that shows what type of money. And that's just a college of engineering. That's, it has nothing to do with any of the other departments. The College of Engineering is a world by itself at U of I. Right? And so, as I'm hearing them talk about this in this room, with folks that look like us up in this room, I'm being one speck in the room, being able to hear this conversation is important. To hear it. To know that it's going down, and then ask the question, well, how does that translate in terms of how this biomedicine is going to roll out in the black community? What does that mean? in terms of Medicare and Medicaid and, and costs, in terms of technology cutting costs and that. What does guided care look like in our communities? And then who's delivering that message? What are the careers that are going to emerge out of that as it relates to this new discipline of bioengineered medicine and the partnership of engineering and medicine at the U of I, and it being the first? And they talk about it's important for them to make certain they're partnering with minority serving institutions. Like, oh my God, that's hair still all day long. That's young people at Ferguson that's passionate all day long to make change. <clears throat> These are young people everywhere that's coming from around the world to go to the U of I to get this knowledge, to take it back to either their communities or to their countries to form companies that will do business here and in our communities. And how that translates to us is something called Innovation Celebration that I attend each year at the U of I. It's a celebration of the latest research and entrepreneurship opportunities at the U of I. There are typically four or five hundred people in the room. There's probably about three people that look like you and I in the room. When I walk in the room, that day, and it was two days ago, a company called Volition makes video games. One game of theirs is very popular called Saints Row, spinoff of the Grand Theft Auto franchise. The first caricature they have in this environment where innovation <laughs> is high and appreciated is a pimped out, stacked uh, caricature of a black male in a pimp suit like Huggy Bear. And with a microphone, <laughs> with a microphone staff, and him with stat shoes and leopard skin suit on. And, and, and their whole idea behind the video game is to have this high, these hyper stereotypes in their video game. And so for me, it's, I, I can appreciate y'all doing that within the context of if, they, if, if all the other characters were out there, we were the only one that was out there. And when I played the game at that particular time, that wasn't even the character that y'all was showing. You were showing Johnny Gat, which is a white guy with pistols and guns that's shooting up everything. How come y'all have a caricature of him out there? And so even in this environment where technology and innovation is happening, people in these stereotypes have this general idea of who they think we are. And so we're not going to be invited to the table when real research and purists are being debating these issues because they don't think you're smart enough because they think you're ugly bear. This was in the room. We got Huggy Bear. They got to take that down, right? They can't own that. We got to own that, right? So I want to stop there and just say that at the end of the day, what I've learned in higher ed at the U of I, at one time it mattered when they had Project 500, where they brought a lot of black students in from the late 60s because the cities were burning, 
and we saw a rise in the black middle class because people were going to medical school and kids out of Capri the Greens were getting college degrees and spaces like that. That day is long gone. If you can't write the check in institutional environment, you have no say. I learned that when I started working in advancement and start seeing that you only have say in the academy today if you can write the check. And that's why in the U of I, they're going after international students because the Chinese students are showing up and they're writing checks for $60,000 plus on the spot. And so when I'm driving down the street now, I'm seeing Bentleys and Lamborghinis and high-end imports laying around parking lots like it's no big thing because they've arrived and, and you know, U of I have said that they are a priority and they mean that. They said across the board, everybody has to have an economic plan to be on campus. Every college has to be involved and has some sort of economic plan to raise money for the academy because the state's not giving up. That's the economy. Any questions? I noticed you said a great deal about STEM. Mm -hmm. I think somewhere that you mentioned art. When, when will the STEM become STEAM? Because I don't think you can really have science, technology, engineering, and math without art, because art kind of connects them all as a view. I'm totally with you, Mr. Totally with you on STEAM. I use STEM because STEM is what writes the check. Right. STEAM ain't writing no checks right now. Mm -hmm. Now, contextually speaking, all this is STEAM mm -hmm. in the context of what Apple does, <laughs> right? But the language and the literature that's being used now is not talking enough about STEAM, and people are not writing a check for STEAM. They're writing it for STEM. So again, well, from a policy perspective, where you institutions are investing, we have to speak the language of what's writing the check and what's paying the bill. And then we can spin off and do STEAM and find STEAM within there. So the students got within the coding doctorate class, it's all arts-based, but we're talking about hip-hop culture is an arts-based culture. Art is a STEAM-based culture. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Do you um, know of any other kinds of programs that some of the other HBCUs are using to, you know, compete in these areas? I don't know. I do know that there's an initiative that Silicon Valley is doing to try to, get, to raise their numbers as it relates to getting more minority students involved in uh, technology in some capacity. And as I told Dr. Turner earlier, I said, I just think that's because they catch a lot of heat for having low numbers. They, it's not really that they're respecting the knowledge in my opinion. But I do understand that uh, schools like Jackson State are doing uh, urban farming, like the catfish uh, farm raising and different things like that. And so work is being done out there in different academies. I don't know a lot of it, but I know some of the work is being done. My question would be then, what is the IT backbone on all of this stuff as it relates to how do we create commerce that is going to fund these initiatives? What does that look like in terms of urban renewal and us really making certain that all of our stuff is tied back to redeveloping our urban spaces. My question, I want to use the cliche that in order to make more money, you need money. So in order for HPCUs like Harry Story to be involved in these new endeavor to utilize what we have now to create uh, innovation where do we go to get systems to, to, to begin to get it involved? It, well, it starts at home. It starts here first. Mm -hmm. it, it, it starts with how you think about the student population that you have and what the value of their culture is worth to the academy. So people are tapping into young black talent and Latino talent all day long. Students of color all day long. The question is when you have a space like this where you have a large number um, that's bringing the information. Remember, they, every time they show up on campus, they're bringing content. And an information age is about the information. Uh, and the information they have is very valuable. The question is, how do you pour out that information? And where, the, where, do you, where do you channel that information in terms of getting to the table and being able to have a conversation with the institutions like the U of I that you know is doing some work like that, but also have pipeline initiatives where, where we start looking at um, the conversation of what distance learning looks like, on-time learning looks like, um, what does that look like in terms of MOOC development and things like that where these spaces exist, all that means that there's dollars and cents as it relates to that. But having the conversation in terms of knowing your student population, what they bring becomes valuable and key in terms of market. Are businesses out in the community creating partnerships with programs such as this to help with some of the funding towards bringing students in and giving the university some money also to be able to do some of these programs and initiatives. 
Yes, there are businesses that are out there, but I think that the corporations that you see, like when I when I think about HTC, cell phone company, and them spending 400 million, it's like, I think that, that it takes just as much time to write a $20,000 grant than it takes to write a $10 million. It's easier, in my opinion, to get the $10 million than it is to get to the $20,000 because everybody's after the $20,000, right? And so when you start again, that kind of connecting your question with his, is looking at, again, in terms of the initiatives and the research and the products that are out there, is that there is a significant cultural lane in that. How do you see the academy filling in that cultural lane and being in that lane and being able to demonstrate how the academy can serve that purpose in terms of what they're looking for, right? And so we know, as I talked to Professor Bashir, it's like, okay, all these great sciences like you talked about, he said, you know, again, as technology comes to gets more and more advanced, it's supposed to make things more cost effective. And so they're doing HIV testing in Africa and because they created some device, they can do it on the spot and it's cost effective, right? And so I was like, okay, well that same thing, and so the governments are now investing in that because they created the science to make that more cost effective. But they have the avenue, they find a way to get into the community to get that done. So again, if Harris Stowe, it can be a beacon and be a channel to get to the communities in order to be partnered with these these initiatives, not as an afterthought, but in the beginning. Then that's where we start finding new levels of science and opportunity where STEM becomes a critical player in, in getting those resources and making the partnership. So how can we get um, our young students just to kind of connect with this right now? Because we have some of our students around the table, and so what is it that they can do just, you know, looking at all that they bring to the table because as you clearly illustrated, you know, just their presence, <coughs> their urbanness, their, you know, everything that they bring to the table, that that's something that they can use and connect. So how can they today as college students get connected with this to one day when they go to graduate school or what have you, be a key player at the table? Well, what are your interests now? What are you doing? College students are in the business. Uh, I'm a, I'm studying civil engineering, for me it's like mathematics and civil engineering. So actually the school is in partnership with St. Louis University, mm -hmm. so uh, I'm involved in three and three programs with St. Louis University. And, and yesterday a friend of mine asked me, he, he was like, hey Richard, you the president of international student groups. So I'm like, yeah. And, uh, um, Let's say I'm from Venezuela, you get from Venezuela. Let's say I'm from Venezuela. If I graduate from Harris State University uh, in business, and someone from St. Louis University graduates with the same degree, which is business. So if you, we're going to apply for a job, we have the same, uh, uh, um, um, we have the same level, you know. So I think, the, he told me, I think the, uh, the the company is going to take the one from St. Louis University because he go to Saint, he went to St. Louis University and I graduated from Harvard. So like the fact that I go to Harvard, I would say you're saying the school's degree is worth more than Harvard. Yes, so yes, saying, yes, yeah. yes. And you're saying how do you counter that? Yes. Well, two things. Again, I talked again about why Peter Cho invested four hundred million dollars in the beats. Right, because they understood how to market culture better than anybody else. You know your culture better than anybody else, right? SLU can't teach you culture. Aristotle can, right? And you learn it here and you know it here. So you have to find value in, first of all, being a student in your discipline, right? But then also you're bringing something to the table that they can't do. But then you also have to build partnerships here on campus with other students to begin forming groups to make yourselves valuable within that context. You have to become entrepreneurs in your own right to begin going in doing distance learning, the international travel, and things like that, setting those initiatives up for the academy. So it's like you're working in concert with the academy, and then holding the academy accountable to find you funding to do the work that you want to do. So again, there are a lot of folks that are interested in this work to provide a gateway for you to get opportunity. It's how you leverage the resource. Hands down, this has the best culture in the area. As long as you see it, and as long as you know what it's worth, right? And that's where it begins. That's the difference. And that's the advantage that you have over him that he doesn't have. He doesn't have it. 
I mean, let's say, um, my goal for the future is like gradual, you know, and uh, I'm not trying to get a job. I'm trying to work for my for myself. I right? uh, open my own uh, company. Mm -hmm. So, as an African, I'm not say, I'm not going to say African American because I'm African. As an African, mm -hmm. I think it's going to be so hard for me to open a, a company because, like, first of all, I'm not from the country, so. Even the African American, it's hard for them to to open a company in their own country. Mm -hmm. So, so you want to open a company here? Here. Okay. So why do you think it's gonna be hard? Because uh, when you, I mean, it looks around, look what's going on right now, you know. So like, I I feel. I, feel I mean, what's like, going on right now? I mean, help me understand. I mean, like, uh, the racial the racial uh, issue in America, mm -hmm. you know. So when I was back home, I didn't know it was like that. You know, when you black, they're not they're not gonna. I mean, like uh, to make a difference if you're African American, except when you speak, they're gonna make a difference if you're African or you're not African American. Mm -hmm. So like, when I was back home, I didn't know it was like that. You know, I realized that the uh, African American I treat the way. I wasn't thinking before I come here. Mm -hmm. So that's my biggest fear. So because right now where I come from is no opportunity over earth. That's why my dad decided, decided to send me here to go to school. Mm -hmm. So okay, I, I graduate and I can't open my own uh, uh, company because of those uh, racial issues. So the racial issues exist, but there's several totally examples that that where black people have been in business here a very long time, generations that spite up this. So don't get dissuaded because the propaganda is out there that you can't make it. Actually, yes, you can. As long as you, again, as I say, as long as you know where you are, you know what you're getting trained to do. So, for example, what do you want to do with your civil engineering degree? Uh, I was thinking of my own uh, like, uh, company for, um, to treat water and stuff mm -hmm. because uh, I realized most, most uh, uh, like villages or, or cities back in Africa, mm -hmm. they have too many issues in water uh, water treatment. Mm -hmm. So that's that was my future. So, um, so, um, so you're concerned about water in your country and yeah. here as well. Water water. Treatment. Mm -hmm. okay. Do you know your culture? Yes, of course. Okay, so now you are have opened up a civil culture based civil engineering firm mm -hmm. that can then find out what other scientists are out there doing the same work <coughs> that may have the resources that you don't have. But you have something they don't have. Now you're finding ways to leverage what you have to then open up a company you're looking to build based on your cultural knowledge on what's going on in Brazil and what's going on here. And then you're being a conduit for that conversation and having a civil engineering degree so you know the science too. But you got the leverage because you know the culture. So now you do have a firm that exists. And nothing's going to hold you back from that except the way you think about it. Right? I just, put, I just built you a company that quick. Simply understanding the science of STEM and understanding that there are tons of researchers out there that are doing similar work. Matter of fact, I've got a couple of students of mine that are doing inter interesting work. With them. And they are developing companies as entrepreneurs right now, as freshmen and sophomores. And that's one of the things they talk about at U of I is they leave their graduate students, leave their with companies already formed. And so you and Harris Bell have to start thinking about students leaving here with companies already formed from a cultural leverage perspective where other folks are not doing that. <coughs> but, you, but now that you have devices like this in your hand, at your fingertips, you can find out who in the world's doing what. <coughs> and you find out how to partner with them to do that work. And you find out what money's available with patent attorneys that can help you get it done. Okay? With your intellectual property. You have intellectual property. <coughs> and it's worth a lot of money. We have time for one more question before we adjourn this session. Any other questions? Well, I want to thank uh, Dr. Patterson.